Well, I have been alive for about 15,212 days. I know, I counted. Now, in those 15,212 days, I have never known a day without the sun. I mean, it's been, some of these days have been cloudy like this, but the sun has always been there. Hmm? There's never been a time in which, uh, at 12 noon, I've seen the moon. Or there's never been a time at 12 noon, uh, the sun has just not been in the sky. It was, you know, in the sky one day and then uh, not in the next. Right? In those 15,212 days, the sun has always been there. Well, that's really great information, but just with the knowledge, just with the evidence that the sun has been in the sky 15,212 days, that doesn't tell us very much about whether the sun will be there tomorrow, all on its own. Right? It's great evidence for the fact that there's 15,212 days of sun, but the question is, will there be a 15,213th day or 214th day? In order for me, for me to make that inference, I need a general principle. I need a conditional. I need something that says, since I have seen the sun for 15,212 days, I will see the sun on the 15,213th. That general principle is called the principle of induction. And that's what Russell talks about in this section. Well, so I have seen the sun 15,212 days. And from that I infer, well, from using that and something else, I infer that I'm going to see it on the 15,213th. And the, uh, what I'm going to use to infer that is what we call the uniformity of nature. And the uniformity of nature is, is so natural to, to uh, claim, so easy to, to roll off the tongue that we take it for granted. We don't think of it as something that needs to be proven to be true or anything like that. And the uniformity of nature is basically this, that you know the, fut the future will resemble the past. So in the past, I've seen the sun rise, right? I've got 15,212 days of that. So it's really good evidence that on the 15,213th day that I will see the sun rise. All right. We'd, uh, you know, if, what? If for only 12,500 of those days I saw the sun rise and in the other 12,500 and some change, whatever, uh, there wasn't a sun, right? It was daytime, but there wasn't a sun. Well, then I, I would conclude from that that, well, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that uh, the sun would rise tomorrow. Right? But since uh, I've seen it rise 15,212 days, the probability is really high that the sun will rise. And it's, again, because of this presumption that the future will resemble the past. You know, in addition to the future will resemble the past, we think that, you know, one area of the universe is like all other relevantly similar areas of the universe, right? So. Um, I wouldn't expect to see this on Venus, right? Um, but that's because this is not relevantly similar to Venus. Venus has much more carbon dioxide, is much hotter, and as far as, as, far as we know, it doesn't have any plant life. Right? Um, I wouldn't expect to see this on the surface of the moon. Right? And there's no atmosphere on the surface of the moon. Uh, there's no soil that can be uh, farmed on the surface of the moon. It's also too cold. Now, because of that because the moon is not relevantly similar to this area. I don't expect to see this on the moon. Now, suppose the moon were different. Suppose it, suppose it had an atmosphere. Right? Suppose it had soil, things like this. Uh, I would expect to see something like this, maybe, 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 on the surface of the moon if there are enough of the conditions from this, uh, like this on the moon. Now, the principle, now this uniformity of nature right, is what we use to form the principle of induction, which I'll get to in just a second. But the, you know, there's something really important to remember here. You know, the uniformity of nature is, you know, comes so naturally to us that, that we don't think that it needs a proof. But the question very quickly becomes, well, you know, we, we don't like to just assume things to be true. We would like things to be justified. We'd like to have reasons or evidence for our claims. Well, what proof can we give for the principle of the uniformity of nature? Well. Yeah, like we said, it, we've used the uniformity of nature for such a long time as the basis for the principle of induction, which we'll get to in a second, which is the basis behind scientific investigation, right? You know, since we don't see a, a place like this on the moon, we don't expect there to be things like this on the moon, right? If we did find something like, some, if we thought the moon was relevant to the summit to the Earth, we would expect to find things like this on the Earth, right? 
you know, but, you know, we use the principle of uniformity in nature so much and it's worked so often. We say, hey, it has been working all this time. Why not think that it's going to work in the future? Since it has worked, it will work. But notice, in order to make that inference, in order to make the inference that, the print, that this uniformity in nature will always be the case, since it always has been the case, is to use the uniformity of nature. So, right up front, it looks like we've got to say, if I'm going to prove the uniformity of nature, I've got to assume the uniformity of nature. And you don't prove anything by assuming it's true. Okay, so we talked about the uniformity of nature, and this justifies what's called the principle of induction. And the principle of induction is an inference rule for probability, okay? So uh, this kind of <laughs> complicated, you know, Russell gives kind of a complicated uh, definition for the principle of induction, and it comes into two parts. Uh, the first part is that if we see events A correlated with events B, uh, all the time in the past, then we would expect that if we see an event of a kind A, we can predict that an event of a kind B will follow. And this is roughly what we get from causation. So this is what we try to do. You know, the, um, I, think I, I think I forgot to mention that the uniformity in nature presumes that there are these general laws, right, that governs all of uh, what happens in the natural world. And you know, these causal laws, right? And this is used to inform the uh, principle of induction. So we're trying to determine these causal laws. And what we do is, I mean, this is the basis for scientific experiments. We try to find those events A correlated with those events B. And we try to find, okay, well, what would interfere with that? What would maybe add to it? What is also necessary for it? So maybe it's not just A that leads to B, but it's A, C, and D, which leads to B. We just, you know, we have to figure out what C and D are. Or maybe you know, we'll be doing event of a kind A we haven't seen B, but maybe a different event, call it G, has been interfering with A to, you know, to, to cause B, things like that. You know, that, that's a little bit more what's happening in the text, but this is, this is the idea that we're trying to find th that, those correlations of events, events of a type A along with a type B. So that's the first part, that we would expect to see, you know, if we have seen A and B all the time in the past, we would expect to see B accompany A in the future. Now, the second part has to deal with uh, what kind of probability we can draw from this. Now, you know, this might seem a little confusing, but what Russell says is we can, um, we can draw a greater and greater probability without limit, right? So what he means by that is, you know, with more and more evidence, we could have a 99% chance, a 99.1% chance, a 99.11% chance, a 99.111% chance to keep moving closer and closer to certainty. We don't get 100%. Right. We don't get 100% because of the nature of induction. Right? Induction deals with uh, near certainties, but not absolute certainties. If you deal with absolute certainties, you're dealing with deductive inference, which we, you know, we talk about what we can't be doubted. Right? And we, we discussed what can't be doubted earlier from you know, the earlier sections. I can't doubt my own existence, and I can't doubt the fact that I'm having sense experience. Everything else has an error for doubt. Right? has this little room, this margin for error. And that's where the probability comes in. So here, here's what Russell says, you know, through induction, I can get a greater and greater degree of certainty, but never quite reach it. So, uh, we, you know, we talked earlier in, that, in this chapter dealing with the nature of matter, when Russell said we can never know the nature of matter, we can only know how it affects us. Well, this is the effect. Right? Uh, we can know with greater and greater certainty how matter is going to affect us in the future. Now I said in the last scene that the, that the uniformity of nature can't be proven, it can only be assumed to be true. Well the same thing is true with the principle of deduction. So what, what do I mean by that? Well if, let's, let's say we can prove the principle of deduction. Well if we're going to do that, then remember the only thing that, can be, that, that can't be doubted is my existence and, the, and my sense data. That can't be doubted. Right? Um, so you know, the principle of deduction uh, is not something that I that is just known with any with, with certainty. So what am I going to use 
to prove the principle of deduction to justify it? Well, I'm going to use experience. Well, if I use experience to prove the principle of deduction, I'm going to say, hey, it, it has always worked. All right? The principle of deduction has always worked in the past, so uh, the principle of deduction will work in the future. But if I use that line of reasoning, I'm using the principle of induction to prove the principle of induction. Well, that, that's false, right? You can't uh, use a principle to prove a principle because that's just assuming it's true, just like we saw earlier with the uniformity of nature. So the principle of deduction doesn't look like, at least at this point, doesn't look like it has a proof. Hmm? Um, now, we don't have uh, any evidence against it either, right? Uh, we don't have any proof against the principle of deduction. We don't have any proof against the uniformity of nature, but we don't have proof for it either. So this, this leads us with a really interesting question. How are we going to justify the principle of induction. We use the principle of induction all the time to make inferences about what's going to happen in the future or what we're going to find in different parts of the earth that, that are, you know, aren't necessarily exactly the same as what we find, but pretty close to it. We use the principle of induction all the time. If it's not justified, right? Russell says this early on, if I, can't, if I don't have the principle of induction, I don't have much knowledge at all, namely any knowledge about the future. Well, if, if, if it's not justified, why am I allowed to use the principle of induction?